Hey guys and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop, Fables End, Corset, the expandable card game. In this game, you're going to be playing as one of four different storybook factions, the Wolf, Kraken, Raven, and Scorpion factions. You utilize these decks of cards by choosing one of them along with their story deck, shuffle them up and draw four cards. This is a tactical card game, similar to a lot of TCGs slash LCGs that you've probably played before, but with some unique twists and turns to it. You will be first drawing your cards, discarding your cards that you don't want, adding shields into your area here, which count as kind of like your resources, then playing characters into your rear guard, assaulting into your front line, as well as playing things from your story and um, being able to attack your opponents in multiple different ways, and finally recovering and starting out once again. And it's a turn by turn system. I play, you play, I play, you play. It's a two to four player game. It takes roughly about 35 to 60 minutes to play and it's for ages 13 and up. Let's go ahead and take a look at the game, how to play, and of course, how to set it up, and then uh, my review. To set up the game Fables End, the first thing you do is choose the number of players you're playing with. Based on that, each player is going to get a mat. This will symbolize uh, everything they need to have. It'll give you your turn-by-turn -turn synopsis, it will give you an area to place your deck, an area to place your story deck, as well as your damage marker. After that, choose one of the factions, the Wolf, Raven, Kraken, Scorpion, whatever one you want. Each of the cards represented will have a symbol in the top left-hand corner, or if it's a shield, it'll be directly in the middle. And make sure that these decks are shuffled. Set aside the story cards, you should be receiving five of them, and choose the order in which you would like these story cards to go. I would suggest to start with having the lower value cards on the top, and then the higher ones on the bottom, but you can do it how you want. After you've done that by setting your story deck as well as your main deck here, then you're going to get a damage counter. You can place this right next to your story deck as a little arrow that initiates where you need to put it, and it'll start at zero. After everyone has done this, then go ahead and set the coins or tokens that you can be utilizing. These are like modifiers to damage aside and with reach of all players. Lastly, you'll decide who goes first, and the way you do that is you will take your damage marker here, and each player is going to assign an amount of damage to their story, their top story, um, based on how far ahead they wish to push in order to go first. So I could select three damage, and my opponent might select two. The person who selects more is going to be the person who is going to start the game off, but they are going to have that much damage attached to their story when they begin. Then every single player draws four cards and the game will begin with the first player going first and each player going in clockwise order, taking their turns up until either somebody gets all seven of their shields out or everybody else has been removed from the game by taking 20 losses. Okay, that's basically how you set it up. Let's talk about how to play. So this is a two to four player game, but I here have it currently set up for two players. So I'll set aside all the other players' decks as well as their sheets for play. I have the Raven deck and the Scorpion deck I won't be utilizing, so I'll just go ahead and place it aside. Uh, now I'm going to start. Now, as I said before, everybody should begin the game with four cards in their hand. And what's gonna happen is you're going to look right next to your deck and it will tell you what you do on your turn. As you go through each of the five different phases, uh, you'll finish off by doing whatever it says and the next player will take their turn. To begin with, you have the retirement step, which is any cards in your front line, all the characters and monsters and heroes, are going to go into your sideline. This is like your front line area where you have had units to defend against things and have fought the previous turn, and your sideline is like the discard pile, it's your graveyard. These cards will go into the graveyard. Then you can discard any number of cards. You'll put them into your sideline. So if you don't want certain characters, maybe they have a, a value that's too high, you can place them in here. Uh, then you will draw until you have four cards. After you have done that, you're going to, uh, this is the draw phase, drawing until you have four. You will then check to see if you have the fewest shields. If you do, you will get to draw an extra card. In this case here, I have zero shields and my opponent has zero shields, so I wouldn't draw a card. But if I did have less shields, I would draw this card here. I move on to the third phase of the game, which is shields, and as you can tell, these phases are pretty quick. Uh, shields allow me to A, add a shield to my field. You may draw shields at the beginning of the game, and you may not. If you do draw a shield, you can just place one per turn here on your phalanx. If, sadly, you're not able to have a shield in hand, you can choose a card that is not a shield and turn it into a proxy shield. 
It counts as basically the same thing as a shield, but it's not going to count towards your win condition. You need seven shields. So if you want, you could put one of those guys down instead. The next interesting thing too in the shield phase is let's say it's the second turn and I have a proxy shield and I have a regular, I played my regular shield for the turn. I could, if I wanted to, replace proxies with true shields, real shields. I can put this proxy down, uh, put the proxy back to my hand, I could take out one of these guys here. After I've played a shield and then replaced any proxy shields with real ones in my hand, I can now take my actions and I can take these in any order I want as many times as I would like, as much as I possibly can. Uh, the first thing that I can do is post. You can post units into your rear guard. It's the only place you can post them. They're like basically getting ready to fight. And the rule of thumb is if you look at a card, the top left of the card tells you what type of card it is. So this is from the wolf faction and it has a one, which means you have to have at least one open shield to place this card. On the bottom left, it tells you how much damage it does to your opponent's stories. And on the bottom right is how much uh, damage you take or losses you suffer when this guy dies. In the middle is how much damage he will do to other champions, characters, and monsters. In the middle is your actions, and then the type of character it is, human fighter is in the middle, along with the character's name. On the very top right is a separate little section, which I'll talk about a little bit later, maybe a little bit through this as well, but this is your rushed unit, uh, that you can, you can turn him into a rushed unit from your hand. But in this case, I'll go ahead and post this guy right there, because I have, it's one, I had one shield that was open, and I can do that. I can no longer place any more units because I have no more open shields. The next thing that I can do is I can choose to open if I'm able to. So for instance, uh, each of these cards in my story have a number. And based on the number of cards in my frontline rear guard and my phalanx, uh, I'll be allowed to open up the storybook. If I, if I do have those numbers, so let's just say that I had an extra shield here, and this is three, and I have this three, I can successfully open this up. And I'll do whatever it says. These have two specific types of actions here for opening. There's the open section, and then there's a possibly a closed section as well. Opening is when it opens, closing is when it closes. I'll do whatever ability that this says when I open it. The next thing I can do is I can do any specials. If there are any characters with stars on them in my rear guard or my front line, and I have the ability to do whatever it asks me to do, I can use this. This card here specifically says as a special, I can pay one unbury, to then have this unit get plus three 1,000 counters on it. So there are multiple different types of special actions that usually we revolve around unburying things. I can do that as many times as I possibly can or want to. The last thing I can do is I can attack. When I attack, I take this character here and I can put it forward in order to attack. Now there are three different ways you can attack. The first way is you can attack any characters in the front line of your opponent's field. So for instance, if this front line had this character here, I could assign my 3000 damage to his 3000 damage. However, we'll also have to check to see if there's any um, changes to that damage. There's a rock, paper, scissors aspect at the very top of each of the monster cards, and whoever has the advantage is gonna get a thousand points. The diamonds will beat swords, swords will beat paper, and paper beats diamonds. In this case, the diamond is greater than the sword, they're both at 3,000, this character would then go to three, and this will go to four, and this character would lose going to my discard pile. So if there's a character there, I could fight here in the front line. I only do uh, an attack for each character in my rear guard when I assign them, when I march them over to the front line. The next thing I could choose to do is fight the story. So if I wanted to, I could just simply deal straight damage to the story here. But instead of using the thousands of damage I have in the middle, I would use the bottom left hand side of the card, which has a blue or a red flame. A red flame will indicate the number of damage that the book's page will take, in which case if the player wants to take the damage, they'll simply flip this over to whatever amount of damage it is. If it's blue damage, this damage tramples over the first page, if it defeats that page, onto the second page. However, when attacking a player's story, there are three ways that the other player can defend. One way is they can bring a character from their rear guard into their front line to defend. The next way is they could choose to discard a shield card if they had one into their sideline from their hand in order to prevent the damage. And the final way is they can rush a unit in from their hand, ignoring everything except for their advantage, the number of shields required on the field in order for you to have, in order to play it, and the amount of damage. And in this case, it would be 
3,000. So that's a way I can prevent the damage from this character going to my book, is by either playing a card from my hand, uh, discarding a shield card, or bring a character from my rear guard up to my front line. Then finally, the last way that you can attack. And that is going to be whenever you um, break through. So for instance, let's just say that this character here had two shields and nothing in their rear guard and nothing in their front line. My Crimson Avenger can directly attack their hand. And the way that works is pretty simple. As long as her value, her shield value, is equal to or less than the number of open shields your opponent has, your opponent will have to hand you their hand face down. You'll select one of their cards, reveal it, and fight that card if it's a character card and resolve the effects, or if it happens to be another shield card, they'll simply discard that shield card into their losses, making them instantly take three damage. So three different ways of fighting, whether it's being to your opponent's hand, directly in their character's front line, or to the book. And like I said with the book, the book can be defended in three ways. Discarding a shield card, choosing to have a card be rushed from a player's hand to defend, or using a card from your rear guard and moving it forward. Those are all the main actions in the game. The final thing at the end of the game is pretty simple. The end of the turn is you recover one damage from your story page if you have damage. You can draw a card from your deck. You can choose to close a chapter page if you'd like. And finally, you can bury a unit. If you have units in your discard pile that are considered losses, you can choose to bury them. And the way you do that is you'll take the cards as they are face up in the graveyard, choose one of them, and flip it face down. When you do that, their death counter or lost counter, which might be more, maybe this is a three, will be flipped over and every card on the opposite end only has a one. So it reduces your losses, which means you won't lose the game as quickly when you do that. Just like unbearing with a special ability will allow you to flip these guys face up, maybe making you take more damage, but allowing you to use special abilities. When you finish that, the next player will get a chance to go and they will just go through the same simple steps. They will do their retirement, which is to discard any cards from their front line, discard any cards from their hand and draw back up to four, draw an extra card if they have less shields, add a shield here, add any shields that are true to your proxies by replacing them, post your characters, attack in one of three different ways, use any specials on characters, and then open your book if you'd like. Finally, recover your damage, draw a card, close your page, and bury a unit. And it'll rinse and repeat just like that, up until the point where you're either going to have seven of these shields, in which case the game instantly ends and that player wins, or if 20 of this little skull damage goes to losses, then that is also a way you will get eliminated. And if there are no players left and you're the only person left in the game, you are the winner of the game, Fable's End. That's how it plays. All right, so let's talk about the game and my review. So Fable's End is a TCG, LCG type of a game as a strategy two to four player card game. You'll be playing down resources, mana, mana crystals, shields. It's all of this, it's currency, right? That goes down into your phalanx, your front area of the board. If you played Magic the Gathering, this is your land spot. The only interesting thing about the lands, as opposed to the fact that they, they create the ability to let you place out multiple characters or monsters or fighters or humans, is once you hit that last one, you'll win the game. So this game is kind of timed in that way. Um, is yeah, you, you can add them every round and then also you can win the game with them as well, which is pretty solid. Um, I don't know of any ways you can defeat these guys here necessarily, other than when they're in your hand. What's also cool about this game too is um, if you have less, you have an advantage. As you have less of these shields, you have an advantage and you can choose to have less to draw more card advantage. Another thing that's pretty cool as well is the ability to place proxy shields. So you're never gonna be undervalued as far as your currency goes. You have multiple actions that you can take and you can constantly be dropping monsters down as you go. And at the end of the game or mid to end of the game, things start to ramp up very, very quickly and damage starts to get pretty, pretty insane. There's a lot of combinations a lot of going back and forth. So it's a slow ramp up for the first couple rounds. And then once you hit that third, fourth, fifth turn, that's when it starts to go crazy. I'll give you an example of a turn. I can place out a three headed dragon that has to have five different open shields. Done. Okay, now I can't play any more fives. I only have four open shields. I can play out this two, these Dorshkin siblings. I've got three left. I can play another two, which is a Wolf Jaeger. And then finally, bam, a one Crimson Avenger. And if I had another one, I could place that guy out as well. So I can drop all these units down. Uh, this guy has an attack where he'll suffer you some damage, but he can attack twice for 11,000 damage. 
This one over here is an attack twice as well, and this, if this unit uh, survives an attack, it can immediately attack again. Yep. Uh, the Wolf Jaeger, when this unit attacks another unit, it gets plus 2,000 power until end of battle. All these characters have unique abilities. I can unbury in order for this unit to get plus 3,000 points, and I can do this multiple times, making her very, very strong, and only really at the end of the game. At the very beginning of the game, she's kind of weak. Uh, that's kind of how this deck works. And then I can bring them all into battle. Bam, I attack. Bam, I attack. I attack, I attack, in multiple different ways. In fact, the only main thing, that my main issue, my main qualm with this game, is there are three ways to attack. And you have to understand the nuances for each of the three ways. The main one is the one I'm very used to. It's my unit at my front of my table is going to attack your unit uh, on the front of your table. So, okay, my Wolf Jaeger is a 4,000, your Colossal Serpent is a 10,000, you are going to defeat me, right? And this character will go into my losses. Pretty simple. The storybook one is the most complicated though. I am going to attack with my three head dragon to the story. Okay, well you can't block with your front line, but you can block with a shield in your hand and you can block with a card in your hand, but only if it's rushed, which is on the side here. Or um, you could take the damage or you have the ability to, yeah, those are the, the, you can bring a character from your rear guard who technically hasn't been utilized and bring it up. And that one was very difficult to explain as we were playing this game for them to understand the different types of attacks and why they'd want to do that and the choices between them. It's really cool there and there's a lot of value to when you want to use an attack and why. If you know your opponents have shields in hand and they haven't been able to play them until next turn where they want to, that's when you attack the hand. That's when you get free damage in. If you know that your opponents have not as many blockers in their hand or on the rear guard and you want to hit their story, that's when you do so because they can take four damage from losing with their story cards. If you know that they have a bunch of cards here that are open and you want your opponent to deal with them next round without having these guys exist, you would swing in. Or if they have lots of value here because at the end of, of your turn and it's their turn, these guys will go away into their discard as opposed to into their losses. And maybe you have a character that's stronger than them, in which case it's worth to make sure this character hits the losses and they take three damage. And so you have to kind of finagle your characters based on when you want to do that. Now, these guys here are valuable in the, in the rear guard. The rear guard meets, me, makes them have a lot of, 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 a lot of options. Once they move to the front line, they're just kind of there uh, hoping that they don't get lost at the end of somebody or during somebody's player's turn. You want them to go to your sidelines so that you don't take them as losses. They're kind of like exhausted fighters. They're, they're tapped in a way. Uh, but they do have some options. There's things that they can do. There's cards that allow you to bring them back into their rear guard and that kind of a thing. So every time players have uh, these cards in their rear guard, they have these options and choices they want to utilize. And there's lots of drawing in this game as well, which is pretty solid. Um, the specials on the units are cool. Some of them are way good. This, this, this deck here I specifically really like is the wolf deck. Being able to, as the game progresses and more characters start, you should have characters start losing them, you're going to start getting these characters, all your characters get stronger. All your big guys have twin attacks. They might not be as strong as something like the Kraken faction, but they are able to attack twice, which can give them a huge huge amount of benefit. And then opening these storybooks, having the ability to choose the order of just the five here that you're going to get at the beginning of the game is useful. You can kind of have tutors or the ability to search your deck in order to um, gather certain types of cards to put to your hand. You can have the ability to increase the value of your monsters and choose when you want to utilize these cards. And you're always also trying to defend these cards because these are huge losses. In a lot of cases, your monsters, when they die as losses, Four damage. Oof, that's big, right? Uh, one, 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 not so big, but okay, so what do I have? I have a graveyard like this. Three ones and a four. At the end of my turn, I can just bury this four. Now it's only one. So I have went from seven damage <laughs> to four damage by just burying the one card. You get to do it for free. And then I always get to reduce the damage from my book. So I'm always kind of allowing a certain amount of damage to go to my books, and I'm also almost okay sometimes with my bigger units dying here but what I don't want is my books to be removed. And I also don't want, if I happen to have, I don't know, a few cards in my hand, and I also have a shield in there, I definitely don't want my shields to go away. Because if my shields go away, if I cannot play them, <laughs> uh, then I'm going to basically uh, lose them and I'm going to take a bunch of damage. And they can't be, they can, they're not gonna be able to, I don't know if they can be buried or not. I think they might be able to be buried. I think it's just your storybooks that cannot be. 
But either way, it's three extra potential damage or even one. Yeah, I think the storybooks are the main ones. They're the most nasty because if they get destroyed, you're just having that four damage stacked into your losses. I also like that this game has a timer. So after you've gone through your turn, you'll start to realize, okay, I've got my five shields out. I got a shield in hand. Next time I place this, that means that the next time I draw the shield that I want, which maybe I draw this one, I can end the game as long as my opponents don't break it out of my hand. And so there's never gonna be a really, really long version of Fable's End. I also like the fact that you can play this with more than two players. You can dump out four players in the game board and it all works perfectly fine. There's subtle differences as to how you'll choose to play, when you'll choose to attack, how many units you'll leave in your rear guard as opposed to sending them all out to the front line. And each deck plays very differently. For instance, the Kraken deck, I'll just talk about a couple of them. The Kraken deck is going to allow you to kind of reorganize the bottom and top of your deck, putting monsters on the top to then give all the units in your rear guard more value, making them stronger over time. This deck here is some hard hitters. They're not the heaviest of hitters, but they have lots of special abilities. They have the ability to twin attack, which is really awesome, and the ability to pump themselves up. And then there's two other factions that are also completely unique as to how they play. Now, the game functions the same when you utilize your cards in the same way with the same type of abilities, but each deck is very interesting as to how you want to come and combat these different creatures. Overall, Fable's End is a lot of fun. This is a pretty straightforward and easy to play game, and once you get through it after the first four or five rounds of play, for the rest of your games that you play, you'll understand this game completely. There's not gonna be a lot of confusion, but when you start with teaching a new player a TCG or a LCG or a tabletop card game battling system, it's going to be challenging in this game specifically to understand the different types of combat and why it's important, why you want to do this or that, why unburying or burying it is, and, and, and it's, it, it's not as like straightforward as you might think. Understanding that attacking a player's hand could give you an amazing shield, but at the same time, they might be holding all their big monsters in their hand because A, they can't play them, or B, they're waiting to hold them there as a trap, which means you can take a lot of damage by just trying to get rid of these shields here, which may, means that in some cases for certain players, it might not be worth doing. Nothing wrong with that. There's a bunch of different strategy around that, allowing your cards in your story to seem like they are able to be taken out and having cards protect them is, is totally fine, but it's just not like super cohesive as far as a new player they are jumping in and understanding why you'd want to do any one of these three attacks. And they're going to suffer because of that. And I think for the first few rounds, they're, they're going to learn this. And yeah, it's going to, it's one of those things too, where I think just like most TCGs, you're probably not going to win your first game if you're playing against somebody who's more on the professional level or has played a few more times than you. Um, as well as understand that this game here is a mix of a lot of TCGs. It's not like a slow burn. Once you get to that third or fourth turn, you're dropping almost your whole hand down. And especially when you've got six or even five of these shields down, bam, bam, bam. And you can just br bring them in and smack, 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 smack. And the game can end in like a wham and it can be over. That being said, that's perfectly fine. That feels a little bit like Yu-Gi-Oh! It's got a little bit of magic in here. It's got a little bit of Hearthstone. It's got a little bit of everything, which I, I really, really like. It's, it's, it functions very well, and it has its own uniquenesses to it. All the different abilities function a little bit different than most of the TCGs I've played. This phalanx section, the fact that if you get that seventh shield out it can, in the game is also very unique. And then the stories and how these function, how you can utilize them, or how they can be destroyed is also unique. It's, it's, it's also just the beginning of the game, just to choose who goes first. It's actually going to be a push your luck system or a, a bidding system that can cost you potentially one story guard quite soon. Uh, the artwork. Fable's End has amazing artwork. All of the characters, all of the art, all the graphic design is so easy to understand. Uh, after I've showed you this, this card game, you will know fairly quickly what they all do. This is a shield. This is mana. You get that, right? Or, or a resource. Uh, this is a character. And most of all your cards are characters or shields. I don't think there's anything else other than just the story cards. The top represents the cost. This is the story damage, the main damage. This is going to be the losses you suffer. Over here is your rushed attacks or defenses, and then your main abilities. And once you've played just a few rounds of play, you'll understand them and even remember the abilities because there's not a huge amount. It's not like a lot of these TCGs or whatever that have like hundreds of different abilities. This one here specifically, at least as of now, only has about five to 10 unique specific keywords that are gonna be important for you. For each of the decks, there's more specific specific ones, obviously. But yes, it, it, the graphic design works and makes this thing very legible, very understand, understandable. And the artwork that goes along with each of the decks feels like your own unique personalized deck. And they're 
beautiful. This is, I would say, probably an 8 to 10 out of 10 for each of the different types of art on, on each of the decks in the game. Quality of components. This is a prototype. It may be changed when the new version is, when the game comes out. But as it stands right now, this is a perfectly playable game. I'd be happy, happy to purchase the game. Um, maybe with just uh, different, maybe just in, in baggies as, as opposed to an Altoids container. But... <laughs> <laughs> but no, just as it stands, this this game is, is great. I would I would easily want to pick up this game as a TCG. If I'm looking for a wonderful little LCG type uh, two to four player uh, skirmish game, this would be one I'd pick up as it stands. But I imagine it's going to be even better when you have a chance to pick it up for yourself. Um, regardless though, yes, overall quality is great. After you understand the basics of the game, you're going to enjoy it. And once you understand why you want to attack in specific ways and why that's important, it's, it's, it's going to all kind of meld together and on your fifth round you're like oh yeah I start to see why this is cool and why I like this game. Fable's End is kind of a hidden gem. It's one of those games I'm going to be watching out for and I'm definitely going to be playing this in the future. I hope I see more factions and more units to play because I really really enjoyed this game. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Fable's End. If you'd like you can go ahead and check out this game with a link down below in the description. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit that bell notification button if you feel like we have earned it. If you've watched more than one of our videos here and you think we deserve it, go ahead and push that. It greatly helps us out. We have a live stream every Wednesday and Sunday at 6.30 p.m. PST. One is on Whatnot on Wednesday and the other is on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. All right, guys, that's all I got for you this time. And as always, I look forward to sending out my story against yours next time.